Welcome to Genetic Alliance's webinar series. I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their busy day to join us. My name is Liz Horn. I'm the Director of Genetic Alliance Registry and Biobank. And we have a wonderful webinar presentation for you today about how to market your biobank collection effectively. We've invited two amazing panelists, Mariana Bledsoe, who's the Senior Program Manager for Biorepositories and Biobanking at the Department of Veteran Affairs, and Kathy Sexton, who is the Assistant Director of the Tissue Collection and Banking Facility at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And they will be sharing their experiences about how they have let others know about their sample collection. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Mariana Bledsoe, who will be talking about her experiences when she was with, with the NCI. Yes, thank you very much, Liz. Um, uh, it's great to be here to talk about some of my experiences at um, funding agencies. What I'm going to tell you about today is my experience um, regarding uh, promoting the use of specimen collections at, at at two agencies. The first at the when I was at the National Cancer Institute uh, as a program director and more recently my experience at the VA. Um, and just a disclaimer um, that the viewpoints are expressed in my um, talk today are, are those of my own and shouldn't be taken as the viewpoint of the Department of Veterans Affairs or U.S. government. This is sort of a standard disclaimer that we have to make in these kinds of things. Um, as the write-up for this webinar noted, the strategy of build it and they will come may have worked for Ray Kinsella and Field of Dreams, but biobanks are not ballparks. If you build it, they won't necessarily come. Without careful planning uh, to design a biobank to meet an identified specific need and marketing of collections, specimens may be collected at great expense and not effectively used. I know of several biobanks which set up collections without an identified scientific need in mind that had to actually change their business model because the samples, many samples that they had collected were not being used. Uh, I think Kathy is going to discuss this further in her talk, and it's a very important point. So why is marketing so important? Well, um, there are, are a number of reasons. Based on my experience at the NCI, researchers are just not generally aware of existing collections, although uh, the advent of in the Internet and web-based tools has made it much easier for researchers to locate them. Um, in addition, um, biobanks or repositories need to demonstrate that the specimens and data that they collect are actually being used for scientifically meritorious and eth ethically appropriate research in, or in order to justify continued funding. Uh, I would also like to ar argue that there's an ethical imperative to ensure that specimens are used and that they are used appropriately. If we put participants at risk, even if it's the risk is very, very small, um, we need to try to make sure that there is some benefit to science. And then finally, um, important scientific advances will not be made if specimens sit in freezers and are never utilized for research. Uh, so with, this, with that um, background, I'd like to share my experience. Oh, I'm sorry, um, I advanced too soon. Um, uh, I'd like to share my experiences from the perspective uh, of a funding funding agency first with my experience at the NCI from uh, 1996 to 2005. Um, back in about 1996, the NCI funded numerous specimen banks and biorepositories, yet there was no central compilation of what resources exist. Um, we would hear from the scientific community that they needed specimens for their work, but they were not generally aware of existing resources. So in 1997, we established a program called the NCI Tissue Expediter Program to help researchers find specimens for their work. Uh, the program involved a three-pronged approach, um, promoting the use of existing collections through ex extensive marketing and advertising, um, the establishment of a centralized database of exi existing collection, and the third prong of this approach involved a scientist who would serve as the NCI tissue expediter who would work uh, with investigators on a one-on-one -on -one basis to help them identify appropriate sources 
of specimens, a matchmaker, if you will. Uh, the NCI Tissue Expediter is a scientist with access to extensive information about resor resources that exist, including private collections. Um, where readily available resources don't exist, um, the NCI Tissue Expediter helps establish collaborations between a researcher who needs access to specimens and um, other researchers or resources that have the specimens that they need. Um, the Tissue Expediter receives inquiries um, by email, phone, and fax, and uh, the NCI Tissue Expediter uh, is um, it is still taking uh, requests um, for uh, specimens. Um, we also developed a, a web-based database called the Specimen Resource Locator to help researchers locate the most appropriate resources. We collected uh, information on NCI-supported collections uh, that involved um, information, aggregate information, about the types of specimens, um, the types of an, and extent of associated data, the numbers of cases, uh, access requirements, and contact information. And we also, um, as part of this um, database, um, established some business rules um, that would help steer investigators to the most appropriate resources. It turns out there are many, many resources out there, um, and re researchers often have difficulty choosing from among them um, to, to find the right one. So we built in uh, business rules into this database. For example, um, if a researcher didn't need access to extensive clinical and follow-up data, the program behind this database wouldn't direct them to precious collections, uh, which include such data, but to other more appropriate uh, collections. The database um, is still in existence and um, currently contains more than 41 different resources representing approximately 200 and different, 210 different collections. Um, they include human tissue procurement systems and specimen banks, uh, specimens from normal, benign, precancerous and cancerous human tissue, uh, serum, DNA, RNA, and, and other types of samples. The database includes a, a public side and a private side accessible by the NCI Tissue Expediter, which contains information on private collections that may exist. Uh, the specimen resource locator, as I said, um, returns information um, that includes only aggregate information. And this was actually by design. Uh, we wanted um, to, the researcher to contact the managers of the collections directly to discuss their needs in detail and work out uh, arrangements for access. Um, we found that that kind of one-to-one -one interaction is really critical uh, to ensuring that specimen collections are used and used appropriately. Um, so the information displayed on resources, uh, for each resources, uh, included uh, the, the basic information on the slide. Um, there are a number of other ways um, besides the development of web-based resources and tools that funding agencies can promote the use of specimen collections. They can, for example, build into their solicitations for funding information about available collections or even require the use of specimens from collections as part of part of the funding proposal or application. We actually did this while I was at the NCI. Um, we also took out full page journal advertisements in major scientific journals um, that included brief descriptions of what specimens are available for each, each resource and whom to contact for more information. Um, uh, we've al already mentioned websites and an effective web presence uh, can help spread the word about availability of specimen collections. I'm now, now going to um, move on to my uh, more recent experience um, at the VA. Uh, I joined the VA in uh, 2011. Um, the VA funds a number of uh, uh, specimen banks centrally, such as the Million Veteran Program or MVP Biorepository, uh, a post-mortem brain bank with tissues from deceased veterans with ALS and a newly launched um, uh, pilot for a Gulf War veterans illness brain bank. 
um, VA also supports um, research at more than 115 sites. And so we may have other research uh, specimens collect, uh, collected at those sites. Currently, um, no centralized inventory exists of available collections. But as part of an effort to help market the availability of um, VA specimen collections, we are planning to establish a registration system that would help us build an inventory of specimens that are, of, are available uh, to the research community. We also plan to explore how to build um, uh, build into uh, appropriate funding initiatives uh, the use of specimen collections um, to support research that is important to address uh, veterans' health issues. Uh, so what are my key take-home mes messages from my experiences? First, it's very important to design your biobank or biorepository to meet an identified scientific need. Um, don't just collect everything that you can without giving careful thought to how the specimens will be used. Uh, it's important to do market research in advance. In addition, um, make sure that you anticipate future uses in the design of your consents. I know of several situations where potentially valuable collections may not be able to be used because they contain specific language about who would use the specimens or where they would be stored. Um, also, it's important to develop a marketing plan very early in the development of your repository. Um, but you need to make sure that you have all your procedures and policy in policies in place so that you're ready to receive and process requests for specimens expeditiously so that you don't disappoint researchers. Another point to keep in mind is that marketing is a continual and ongoing process. Don't assume that researchers will necessarily remember where they got their specimens. Um, they need to be reminded um, frequently. Um, another key take-home message is the importance of clearly defining what will be required for access to specimens and associated data. Make sure that researchers understand the limitations regarding what is available and how long it will take to process requests. It's very important in this, um, in this area to manage expectations of the researcher. Um, and then one of the most important things to keep in mind is the um, importance of a direct dialogue between the biobank repository and the researcher who may be looking for specimens. Um, this is critical with regard to helping researchers to refine their requests and to help educate them on appropriate uses of specimens and data and the limitations on what is reasonable to request. Sometimes they don't understand uh, constraints that may be imposed by um, standards in, in, in care or, of, or what is able to be collected. And then finally, uh, I just want to um, uh, mention a number of related activities. I think Liz may uh, maybe maybe speaking about this, the ORD has established a um, biorepository database, and also the NHLBI, Heart, Lung, and Bud Institute, has developed a uh, similar website to help researchers find specimens for their um, work. And then um, the International Society for Biological and Environmental Repositories has established a working group um, that will. Uh, that is looking to uh, pull together aggregate information on what resources exist because there is no no such um, resource currently available. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to invite you all to come to the International Society for Biological and Environmental Repositories meeting that's going to be held uh, in Sydney, Australia in uh, 2013. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mariana. Um, we really appreciate you presenting for us today. I did have one question, excuse me, one question that came up that I thought maybe you could answer right now. Um, and please keep typing your questions and sending them in. Is the tissue expediter intended to advertise existing biobanks or to advertise organizations that are willing to conduit sample processing as well? 
Um, it really is. Um, it really is designed to help researchers locate um, existing specimens from existing resources. It's, it, it doesn't go uh, go to that level at the database. Although, um, it if if there was a request to the NCI tissue expediter, they m might well be able to refer um, organizations to uh, the types of services that that you um, that you mentioned. Great, thank you. And we have a lot of questions coming in and we'll have a lot of time for question and answer at the end. Um, I would like to introduce Kathy Sexton who will be telling about her experiences. And while we're switching um, the presenter, I would also just like to remind everyone, well, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, remind you that you are all on mute so you can um, enter your type in your questions and we will be getting to as many of them as we can during the presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, very much. Uh, I appreciate, first of all, being invited by Liz and Genetic Alliance to participate. Um, so I am the Assistant Director of the Tissue Collection and Banking Facility at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, our repository, Liz asked me at the beginning of the presentation to tell you a little bit about the type of repository that I manage, um, some of the, the data that we provide, and what our access policies are. So I'm going to spend a few minutes at the beginning uh, discussing some of that. So our facility is actually a combination of a number of different repository activities. Uh, some of which are prospective procurement and some of which uh, specialize in banking. They all have to do with human tissue procurement. Um, so our prospective components, what we do there is collect specific specimens and process them in a specific way for a particular investigator request. So unlike banking, those are collected with a particular project or investigator in mind and processed accordingly. So uh, annually, our prospective components distribute uh, about 8,000 tissue and fluid specimens and about 13,000 slides to about 150 investigators. Um, we also have a number of banking components that collect and bank annually about 11,500 tissue and fluid samples each year. Our prospective uh, components of our facility include our Cancer Center Tissue Procurement Shared Facility, which is a core facility of our Comprehensive Cancer Center. Now the mandate of this facility is to provide services to primarily to our Cancer Center members. It does operate as a prospective service, so they let us know what they need and then we try and procure that accordingly. Very similar to that is um, the Cooperative Human Tissue Network, of which we uh, operate as the Southern Division. The CHTN, as it's more commonly known, is made up of six academic institutions that are funded by the National Cancer Institute to work together as a network to prospectively procure specimens, process them, and provide them to investigators throughout North America. Now, although we do serve primarily North America, we have uh, recently begun accepting and reviewing on a case-by-case -case basis some requests from investigators outside of North America and have provided some, uh, a number of paraffin blocks to some researchers. Now the banking components of our facility include uh, banks for four specialized programs of research excellence, also known as SPORs, that we have at UAB for our breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and cervical SPORs. So tissues are collected and banked specifically for those various SPORs. We also have a bank for and serve as the um, repository for the Pulmonary Hypertension Breakthrough Initiative, which is a group of institutions around the country that collect diseased and control lungs from explanted lungs removed during lung transplants, and also control donor lungs that are unable to be used for transplant. 
So these disease, tissue from these diseased uh, procedures and control procedures are collected and banked and distributed to researchers doing work in pulmonary hypertension. Similarly, here at UAB, our Cystic Fibrosis Center has worked with us to set up a what they call an airway tissue procurement um, initiative where we collect tissue from, again, lung transplants from patients with cystic fibrosis and also other diseased and normal controls for work with our Cystic Fibrosis Center. And then we have a, a liver center bank. This is a little different from our other initiatives in that someone else collected the tissue and processed it, and we basically just manage that bank for them. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. And then we do just some general banking. For example, if we uh, obtain a specimen, such as, for example, a breast tumor, and the specimen is large enough that we're able to assign tissue to everyone who we actively have requests from, but we have some left over, what we'll do is just stick some aliquots of that specimen in the freezer. Then in the future, if we get requests for frozen tissue, we'll go and offer what we might have in our general bank um, so that we can try to immediately meet those requests. We also have a large um, inventory of fluids uh, that we collect for our cancer center as a bank. Now, as far as the data that's associated with our collection and what we provide, we routinely provide to investigators the age, race, and sex of the patient from whom the specimens were obtained, and we provide a quality control diagnosis of the actual specimen that's provided for research. Now, this is is maybe different than just providing them with a copy of the pathology report, which indicates the diagnosis of the overall specimen. But just because, um, let's say, for example, it was uh, tissue obtained from a colon resection and the patient was diagnosed as having an adenocarcinoma of the colon, there's no guarantee that the tissue specimen we obtained for research is actually tumor tissue. So what we do is do uh, perform quality control on a mirror uh, piece of tissue that we fix and process to a paraffin block and cut an H&E slide from, and then that's reviewed by a pathologist who renders a diagnosis to confirm um, what the tissue is that we're providing for, for the research and also provides us with a percent tumor, percent necrosis of that specimen. Um, so then we can actually let the researchers know what they're getting from us. Similarly, for the uninvolved or normal tissue, that's looked at also to make sure that there aren't um, cells that shouldn't be there or uh, some kind of disease process going on. Or if there is, we can let them know that it's uh, some hyperplasia or we see fibrocystic changes um, or lung with emphysema from a lung case, for example. We also provide them with a de-identified copy of the pathology report so they can see what the pathologic diagnosis was of the specimen and what procedure uh, from which it was obtained. Then as far as um, clinical information, patient history, and follow-up, those can be obtained um, upon request. We do charge an extra fee for that because uh, of the additional time and effort that may be involved in uh, reviewing a chart and obtaining that information. So that is information we do provide upon request and as it's available. Now, as far as our accession policies for our prospective procurement, the uh, CHTN is open to anyone that applies and meets the requirements and fills out the application. Our Cancer Center Shared Facility is open to any UAB Cancer Center member. Uh, we do have processing fees that apply for both of these, for both the specimens and then, as I mentioned, for additional information that may be obtained. For our banks, those pretty much have closed access, but sometimes can be made available to outside researchers um, on a request basis. They can apply and and indicate why they want specimens from these banks. That access is controlled by a tissue utilization committee who reviews that and decides whether those requests can be met. Because uh, the groups funding these banks 
really control and fund them and distribute them. Um, they sort of have control of those. Except for our general bank inventory that I mentioned earlier, those specimens that we bank generally that are not a part of these closed banks can be made available um, to either our internal users or to our CHTN users. Um, so they're not owned by either one. They can be made available uh, really to first come, first serve basis. Now to talk about some of our marketing efforts. For our banks, we don't typically market them because they're, they're really for closed collections. But for our prospective procurement, um, we do and have employed a, a number of different efforts. Uh, internally, we try to exhibit at our Cancer Center annual retreat, and we also send email blasts uh, periodically to our Cancer Center members. Most of our marketing efforts have been associated with our external procurement. Um, we exhibit at national meetings, for example, the American Association for Cancer Research and for Experimental Biology. We have an exhibit for the CHTN that we take and we exhibit there every year and try to talk with uh, researchers there. We um, apply to search engine, we have search engine listings on Google and Bing so that when anyone um, Googles for human tissue, the CHTN will come up. Um, we have advertised, as Mariana mentioned, we've advertised in journals, scientific journals. We also have a newsletter that we distribute. And then we've, uh, from time to time, have targeted research offices at major medical centers to try to uh, get them to pass along the word of our availability to their researchers. And then during the past year, the CHTN has started using a contact management software to be able to better track our leads. Then both of our prospective groups have a website that we use, and then we depend uh, a lot and seem to get a lot of uh, new users via word of mouth or referrals. Now, as far as what worked best, um, our exhibits at the national meetings, uh, we really, really like to do, and that seems to work well because it gives us an opportunity to meet with researchers one-on-one, face-to-face, -on -one, -face, to spend a little time with them and talk about what their needs are and uh, what we might be able to do to meet those needs. Now, we've been doing this since 1987, and so we've been around a long time, but every year we'll run into researchers who are so happy to see us because they say, well, I never knew this resource existed. So we found that that's a, a good way to connect with those researchers. The search engine listings um, seem to work well to get folks when there are a lot of people are, are using the internet to try to find what they need these days. And if you don't come up and they don't know you're there, they won't contact you and uh, begin to use your, your resource. Um, our contact management software we found, um, just an observation that's been made this week is that we've, our, our number of leads has gone up this past year, whether that's attributable to really having a number uh, of additional leads or whether it's just the fact that we now have a system for managing those leads where we didn't have that before, it's, it's unsure to know, but that seems to be something that has really helped us follow up. Um, it's also something that our researchers can go into directly and contact us to tell us when their needs change and to ask questions. Um, our websites work well in that we can refer people to our websites for information, for our application. Uh, and then, of course, always the word of mouth and referral when uh, people can tell their colleagues to call you. The things that, um, it's not that they didn't work, but maybe they didn't work quite as well as some of the first category. Some of the advertisements in journals, it, it, it's been difficult to really gauge how effective that has been, and those also tend to be expensive. So if you have a limited budget available, uh, sometimes we've opted not to utilize our resources in that way just because it's been difficult to, to know the effectiveness and because of the cost. The newsletter distribution uh, goes primarily to people that are already on our list, so it's effective for uh, those people we already have in contact with, and we also have that available at the meetings where we uh, we exhibit, but as far as reaching other folks, not quite as good as some of the other methods. And then the targeting of research offices at, at major medical centers, um, 
sometimes we didn't see a lot of return on that. So then, if you build it, will they really come? Um, my advice, as Mariana mentioned, is to solicit input before you build. Find out what the researchers need. Find out how they need it. And then define the goals of your repository based upon those needs. That may mean that you might need to consider, instead of a bank that you might be thinking about, maybe prospective collection might meet your researchers' needs a little better. Or consider um, a repository that might combine both prospective and banking. Maybe you say, well, that horse has already left the barn. I've already got my repository. It's a little bit too late for me to start thinking about that. So what are some other things you can do? Well, try thinking outside the box. For example, what services are at your institution that might relate to specimen procurement and processing that your biorepository could assist with? Um, most institutions will have clinical protocols and research protocols going on that will involve the collection and processing and distribution of human tissue. Um, a biorepository can do that a lot better than maybe a clinical staff who might not have access to dry ice, might not know the best way to freeze tissue, might not necessarily know how to ship it. So here we're involved in a number of clinical protocols um, that require the processing and handling and distribution of human tissue. And so what we do when that comes in, we will review the needs, we'll um, put together an estimate, and then when that's funded, we'll provide those services, and then we can bill for those services to recover our cost. There may be other um, repository collections at your institution, such as I mentioned our liver center collection. Maybe there are other groups that have been collecting tissue, but the management is not going so well, and you can manage those repositories. For example, with our liver center, they were managing that until uh, someone um, was not doing a very good job of keeping touch about what was going on with their freezers, and they lost most of their collection one weekend because the freezer went out. So after that, they approached us about transferring the collection to us, which they did. And so we've been managing for that for them without incident now for a number of years. Um, you might think about providing histology services for research. Uh, we have a fully functioning histology laboratory that's part of our uh, repository that not only performs quality control for us, but also uh, processes paraffin blocks and slides for researchers. Uh, we can perform macro dissection. You might consider also providing tissue microarrays. Make friends with uh, your surgical pathology and surgery staff, because people will go to them when they need tissue, and they can refer them to you. And if you, um, if they can trust you and you have a good relationship with them, they would much rather refer people to you than to try to keep up with a number of requests on their own to try and serve. As Mariana mentioned, uh, it's very important when uh, consents are uh, written and put together to try to generalize those consents as much as you can or at least put in a statement, put in some language to indicate that uh, not only might tissue be provided for this specific project, but it also might be given to your repository for distribution to researchers. That way, if, for example, on a clinical protocol we have, if the tissue doesn't qualify for the clinical protocol, the consent doesn't prohibit it from being used by us for other purposes. For your banking initiatives, you might think about offering investigators specimens that are a, a close match, even if they don't match exactly. We found uh, when we do that that investigators like the ability of having specimens readily available and will often go ahead and accept those specimens even if they don't match just exactly. So in summary, if your repository is correctly planned, implemented, and marketed, they will come and you will hit a home run. So thank you very much.
Kathy, thank you so much for that great presentation. I had two quick questions that came in that were specific to what you're doing, so I thought this might be a good opportunity to ask you now. The first okay. question is, do you, charge, do you charge a fee for samples or associated data? We do. Um, we charge a fee. Uh, there's an internal fee and then an outside fee. Um, for example, with the CHTN, there's a processing fee of $50 per specimen for um, non-commercial investigators and $150 for those located at commercial institutions. Um, and then if we provide additional data that I mentioned that does require a chart review, we charge an additional fee of $40 just to help us recover the cost of the time and effort that's spent in reviewing the chart to extract that information. Great, thank you. And we just got another related question. Um, what percentage of the budget for your organization is covered by funds generated by distribution of biospecimens to researchers? Uh, probably, probably about 20%. Most of our funding is from the grants that we have but probably about 20 or 25 percent would be generated from program income that comes in directly from the specimens. Great, thank you. And then one quick question. Um, can you tell us the name of the contact management software that your organization uses? Yes, it's a Zoho uh, CRM associated with Zoho, Z-O-H-O. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I wanted to do a little more housekeeping right now. I really appreciate the questions everyone is sending in. Please keep sending them in. We're trying to um, cover them some as we go, but we will have ample time at the end. So what I would like to do now is I would like to switch gears and um, present my part. And I'm just getting my slides up now. Um, so this is the, the famous scene from Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And I think that what we're finding is if you don't plan, people don't come. And we really want people to use our biospecimen collections. We want to do it because it advances research. We want people to use them because we put a lot of time and effort into it. And we also really want to do this for the people that have donated their samples that have given a gift that really want research to happen. So there are many reasons for the science, for the people, but we, we really need to plan to make that happen. So in the short time that I will be talking to you, I will be um, covering some basic strategies for letting researchers know about your sample collections. And again, some of these have already been covered by our excellent panelists, Mariana and Kathy. And then I'll be telling you a little bit about what the CFIDS Association of America is doing to encourage research. And then I will be speaking about RD Hub, another biospecimen locator initiative that's out of the Office of Rare Disease Research. And, oh, there we go. So making samples available. When you do this, you really need to think from a policy perspective. It's very important to have a policy of who has access. And you'll need to make decisions. Is it all qualified researchers? Is it just people in a consortium? Is it a local institution? And again, you'll need to make the right decisions for your specific situation, but I think it's important that the policy is transparent so people know who has access. You'll also need to prioritize samples. In many collections, there are some very rare samples that you want to make sure that are really being used for appropriate research. And again, if a researcher asks to use these samples and they don't have access or, or you won't be distributing them, I think it's really important to just let them know why. And in many instances, it might just be that their research isn't a high enough priority for something that's very, very rare and, and very valuable scientifically. You want to have an application process. And you'll probably want to have a committee, whether it's an oversight committee or an access committee, who then makes the decisions looking at the science, are these um, worthy projects, should we give samples to these researchers. You'll need material transfer agreements to transfer samples. And again, you'll need all the legal and regulatory issues around the consent to say that you can use these samples in future research. 
There are cost recovery mechanisms, which Kathy talked about a little bit, and cost recovery can help, but it won't fund your biorepository. You'll also want to require people that use your samples and your data to acknowledge that in presentations and publications. This is also a really good um, word of mouth for others. You know, you're at a scientific meeting, someone's looking at someone's poster, it's really interesting data, and then it acknowledges the biorepository for providing those really high quality samples that allow the, helps allow the data to happen. And again, I, I think something that's really important is getting feedback about sample quality. Are the samples useful? Do they work in the experiments? Um, we all know that science is changing, how we collect and store biospecimens is changing. And I think just getting information back about which samples um, meet quality, meet the QC uh, conditions that researchers put them through, as well as which ones have been very useful. So advertising your collection, and again, Kathy covered almost all of these, so um, I won't go into them in a lot of detail, but I think really if you can enlist help from the people that are using them, it can be very useful. You may also want to have a researcher section of the website where researchers can go and look and see what you have, have a data sample or catalog, use existing portals. Um, you can also utilize funding opportunities, and again, acknowledgments and collaborations really are key, and they can help get the word out about your sample collection. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the CFIS Association of America. They are a disease advocacy organization that focuses on chronic fatigue syndrome, and they really are doing patient-centric research. So they have this key group of investigators that they find that help them collect biospecimens, CFIS is also identifying um, participants through their organization as well. And so it's a partnership that helps engage the researchers, it engages the patient community. So the researchers help with recruitment, they all have ready access to well-characterized samples. They're really true partners. They um, also have funding opportunities, they're funded, they're required to share their data back with the organization and with each other. And then there are material transfer agreements and shared IP that allows all of this to happen. And this hub structure really increases the likelihood of discovery and sustainability. It, one of their recent funding opportunities, they prioritize applications that use samples from their biobank. And I think that is another creative way to in encourage use. And they have a um, really nimble and flexible design where people are enrolling into the registry. Some, they have a peer review process to look at proposals. Some participants have already given samples. If they have the inventory and the study meets the eligibility criteria, the, the samples are shipped to investigators. But if, if they don't have these samples, then they actually recruit participants to give the samples and this is sort of their process, but it really allows a very nimble way to collect the samples that are needed and really on demand based on the needs of the researchers. And again, this helps control costs instead of just collecting everything. And I wanna thank Suzanne Vernon who wasn't able to join us today and the, these are her slides and I think CFIS is really doing an amazing job of, of pushing this idea forward and really fostering collaboration in the, in the research community. I want to shift gears to talk about RD Hub. This is an initiative out of the Office of Rare Disease Research, which is out of NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. Um, RD Hub, as you know, there are so many challenges in rare disease research. There are very, very limited biospecimens. And RD Hub is really a way to let people know what biospecimens exist. So it's a way for biorepository managers to advertise their collections, as well as a way for biospecimen users to find samples on rare diseases. So when you go to the website, you can either enter, enter biorepository data or you can search the database. And it, again, it's really a forum that initiates collaborations. It allows um, biorepository managers to upload their biospecimen collections. They can do it by Excel or manually. manually. Um, they, there's a standard anthology and vocabulary. There are required fields and optional fields. And it allows capturing of annotated information about specimens as well as de-identified patient medical information. There's a way to contact 
each, each repository that's submitted the data and samples. And right now, um, there are 29 contributing biorepositories. So I would suggest that everyone list their samples in this resource. Um, and you can see this is where the manager would have a username and a password. There are a number of required fields. And again, it's just so people that want to use your samples can get in touch with you. There's some information about the biospecimens as well. And then there's a lot of really useful optional information um, that you can add in. It's not required, but I think it helps um, users to understand more about your collection. And again, if they really need some demographic information and you don't have it, then I think it saves time for, for everyone. So right now, for investigators, it lists 7,000 rare diseases as well as other common diseases, including cancer. For each rare disease, it's linked to GARD, which is the Genetic um, Information and Resource Center. It also provides information and links to other resources. There's a searchable database. I'll show you some screenshots. And it allows you to locate specimens within a single institution or multiple repositories. And really, it facilitates collaboration between investigators and facilitates data sharing both across the US and other countries. So this is what the search interface looks like. As you can see, um, I just clicked on N, and you can see all of the diseases with specimens. These, in, these that are underlined linked to guards. You can find out more information about the disease. On the right, it shows you how you can um, narrow your search based on the tabs across the top. So if we click on Neiman Pick Disease Type C, we can get a lot more information from the Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center. We also have a lot of diseases without specimens, and they're listed here. You can get more information about them in GARD. But at the very beginning, you can see which ones have specimens, which ones do not. I searched progeria, um, partly because progeria just had a wonderful um, breakthrough in treatment within the past few weeks. But um, as you can see, all the progeria samples come up. You can see the ones that have been um, entered by the Progeria um, Research Foundation Cell and Tissue Bank, as well as those that are in Coriel. It tells you what type of specimen it is, DNA, blood cells, tissue. It gives you the source. It tells you what the processing method is, and then roughly how many samples they have, which, which is really quite useful, because you know if you need 100 samples and you know, there are only, there are less than 50 in this collection, that's not going to be a useful collection. When you click on view, you get more detail about the collection and who to contact. And so I'm going to stop there because I wanted to make sure that we had ample time for questions and answers. I would really like to thank my panelists, Mariana and Kathy. I'd like to thank Yaffa Rubenstein and Suzanne Vernon for helping me with the presentation. And I'd also like to um, thank ISBER, who allowed us to advertise this on their listserv. And it really is a great organization that's moving forward our knowledge about biospecimen science and just really how to go about these challenging issues in, in biorepositories. So I am going to, wow, we have a lot of questions. That is awesome. I'm going to start asking questions, but I wanted to ask a question to Mary Anna first about, you talked about advertising in um, journals, and I know Kathy mentioned that it really wasn't as useful for their, um, for, for their biorepository and it wasn't quite as cost effective. Do you have any idea of how well it worked for, um, some of the projects you worked on? Yeah, I mean, again, this was back in, um, let me, this was back in, um, you know, 1997, 98. Um, we did this for a while. We really didn't have a good way of, of sort of tracking, a very, um, a, good, a very good way of tracking exactly how researchers um, found out about the resources. We we were able to get some general sense, um, but we did it as a start. We did it to help promote not just the resources, but also to promote uh, knowledge about the existence of the, the NCI Tissue Expediter Program. So it served a number of different purposes. Um, you know, since that time, of course, um, the web has become much more popular. There's been more web-based tools, and you know people rel are relying, in fact, on 
less and less on hard copy anything. Um, so I think it, it is a strategy that, that, that can be used, but as Kathy said, I think um, it, in, a, in a time of limited funding, it, it may not be uh, the most effective choice. Great, thank you. And this is for both of you. I mean, I know we've talked about newsletters. Do you have any experience of newsletters that were associated with an email blast? I mean, do you think it's more useful to do things electronically these days to advertise collections? Um, I'll, I'll try to respond first. Um, we have not done that in an email blast as far as a newsletter. Uh, one thing I guess we've tried not to do is bombard our researchers with information because if you bombard too much, I think they tend to turn you off. So we, when we do try to send out information, we try to make sure that it's meaningful. Um, we have our newsletters. We do send electronic versions of our newsletters to uh, our current investigators and to anyone who may ask to receive them. Uh, oftentimes we'll get leads at our national meetings and folks will say, I'd like to be on your, your list to receive information. So those people, we do send electronic versions of our newsletters out to them. Um, but we've not really tried blast of our newsletter per se to, to large audiences unsolicited other than having copies of them available in hard copy at the national meetings. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I don't have any I don't have any direct experience with that, but my sense would be the same as Kathy's in that, you know, people are just so overloaded, especially with electronic information, that it's it's hard to know sort of how much of how effective those things are. Now Having them available on a website where people can sort of download them is, um, you know, is is another, you know, is another option. Right, and I'll also add there is also one other thing that I failed to mention that we do use when we go to the national meetings. We purchase the mailing list, um, the list of attendees, and we send uh, an email to them, letting them know we'll be at the meeting. And if they have an interest in what we're doing um, so that they can come by and visit with us. But we also provide them with a link so they can go to our website in case they don't get by. And we do get a lot of leads uh, generated from those targeted mailings to the meeting attendees. I just wanted to, to mention one other thing, and I don't know, Kathy, you can address whether or not you're still using this technique. And it is. Um, for, for resources like the Cooperative Human Tissue Network that people may use once and then kind of forget about the you know about uh, where they got specimens, although let's, we we hope they don't do that. Um, we had at one time uh, the the um, CHTN had purchased um, rule, rulers to hand out. I don't know if you're still doing that. We are. Space. And you we know the are, nice yeah. thing about them is unlike pens, which you know which run out and you throw people throw away, those are things that they might have around in their lab and might keep, and and it has information on it. So there's there's all kinds of strategies that one can use to remind people um, of of the existence of a resource. We do. We have centimeter sticks that have the our logo, our website, um, our one eight hundred phone number, which we also have as a marketing tool, and those are given away at the national meetings. And um, we usually give away a, a tremendous number of those. So hopefully, those are in people's labs. So when they do have a need for tissue, they'll have that handy. And Kathy, what's your marketing budget, roughly? Well, I guess that's hard to say. We don't have a marketing budget per se as part of our grant. Um, we do put in some inf several thousand dollars per year for every division to do some specific marketing, and then we also uh, use some of our program income. Uh, that's how we use it for marketing. So the CHTN Coordinating Committee, which governs the activities, um, we actually have a, a marketing and operations subcommittee, and we try to determine what marketing we think will be effective, 
what funds might be available and then the different groups share that. So um, I would just off the top of my head guess several of the divisions, maybe about a um, couple of thousand dollars a year per division, so it's not a huge amount. Great, thank you. And th this question just came in, and it's it's basic, it's specific to a skin cancer biorepository, but I think it's really applicable to all biorepositories. And and just some of the questions Marianna and Kathy and I have had. So the question is: Investigators are almost invariably interested in certain samples, while other specimens collected from patients language in the freezers. How can we, as a biobank, get these samples used for research? Well, let's see. One way, um, is again to, one thing we've done at the national meetings when we meet with researchers, um, we make them available, uh, make them aware of what we have available. Um, or if we get specific requests, we might tell them that we also have these other specimens which may be similar and as I mentioned sometimes we will send a list of specimens um, to someone who might need something similar and because they find out that we have these available they might agree to take them or indicate that they have a need for them. Um, we have also gone out and actively tried to look for researchers who are doing work with specimens that may be banked and contact them to make them aware that we have tissue available and find out if they have a need for it. Marianne, did you have any comments? No, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a whole lot um, to add to that. Um, again, making sure that those collections are, are you know, listed in appropriate websites and, and doing all the marketing things. And also making sure, again, when you design your, your bank that you're designing it around a need and, and, and doing the market research up front. Um, once you have them, you know, you can reach out to um, people who you know might have an interest uh, specifically if, if that's the intent. So would you say that then maybe um, we talked, we didn't talk a lot about this in this um, session, but you really do need to plan and design your bank appropriately. So maybe if people aren't using certain collections and you're still collecting them, it might be a good opportunity to reevaluate and decide what you really should be collecting for Absolutely. what your users need. Absolutely. And, and it also... Can. I'm sorry, Go ahead. the CHTN does this periodically. We will review where the science is going, where the request, how our requests are changing, and uh, modify the services that we have available to try to, to meet the, the current needs. Um, related to that, too, is making sure that when you do provide specimens that you get feedback on the quality. Because as Kathy said, um, Word of mouth is very effective, and if the quality of the specimens are good, you're, you'll get good PR from word of mouth. If they're not good, then then you have a, a, a big PR problem, and it doesn't help your marketing at all. Great. Well, I wanted to thank both Kathy and Mariana for joining us today. Our, our time is up. I wanted to let everyone know that we will be posting the webinar on the Genetic Alliance YouTube channel. We'll be sending that link out to everyone um, as it gets closer. It'll probably take about two weeks to post. And I want to thank you all for spending um, an hour of your very busy days with us and wish you all a great week. Thank you. <laughs>